And as we enter into worship now, let us pause to be still, breathe slowly, recenter our scattered senses upon your presence, Lord. Pray you receive us into your mighty arms, your embrace that heals us, that loves us unconditionally. And Lord, I pray for freedom. Let your Holy Spirit fall on this place. Give us freedom from the bondage, Lord Jesus.
Spirit reset where we can start the day anew, start life anew. I pray for your redemption, Lord, because we're redeemed in you.
You want, to, whoop, you want to do something new in us. God, you want to do something new in us. Just open your heart to that feeling, to what God is doing. You can trust him. You can let go of the things that have been holding you back, that have been keeping you from living loved, living free, living light. That's what Jesus offers you. Barb, would you come up here? Those who have been on our prayer team and through our training, if they have a word from the Lord, we, we let them share, and Barb has something to share. This is a word to all of us. It's, it's from the Lord, and he says to you, this is a word of encouragement. He says to you, I see you in the future, and you look much better than you look right now. <laughs> you look much better than you look right now. Thank you. Woo. Do a chorus again. Oh, shit. 
chains wipe away every stain I'm not who I used to be oh God I'm not who I used to be Jesus I'm not who I used to be I am redeemed this morning I was um, reading in Psalm and it fits right with what Barb just shared so I wanted to read that to you they did not conquer the land with their swords. It was not their own strong arm that gave them victory. It was your right hand and strong arm and the blinding light from your face that helped them for you loved them. Oh, let's just pray together. It's not our strength. It's not something we do that fixes it. You said it's your strong arm. So I pray over all of us here today that whatever it is that we're trying to fix or change and feel discouraged about, thank you that you promise because of your great love and your strong arm, you will take that and you will give us a victory. And it doesn't happen overnight and it's not easy, but it's called surrender. We surrender to the journey we surrender to the process and we surrender to the discomfort and the pain of it because in the midst of all of that you are refining us as gold you I think my husband's sermon might be long. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we always say we, we don't take ourselves very seriously here. So if this is your first time, we, we, uh, our motto is no perfect people allowed. Uh, we, we put Jesus first. And coffee's just a little bit under that. But it, we, um, we do like to have our coffee. So, so anyway, I wanted to um, point that out, that connection card you can turn in. And then what that does is you can get signed up if you give us your email to receive. Um, I send this out digitally each week. So then you can um, see what's happening and what's going on here at the gathering. So you don't miss out on anything. So um, if you, one of the things that we're doing each month is we are doing a week, a monthly spiritual formation practice. And these are practices to just help us grow um, on this journey with Jesus. And so I wanted to just kind of go over that because this is, it's already April 23rd, and this has been our monthly practice for April. So if you haven't read it, you still got time. All right. So for the month of April, we are focusing on the gift of hospitality. We call it table fellowship. We encourage you to connect with someone through dinner, lunch, or coffee, uh, or go on a walk, go on a hike. Uh, Romans 12, 13 says, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. And then 1 Peter 4, 9, Peter wrote, cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. And so I just wanted to point that out. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out is we have some upcoming events. Uh, May 4th is our launch date for Celebrate Recovery. Um, there's, for more information, you can talk to Pastor Ernie or Sarah Harris, who will be leading that. Her, her contact number is on there. And that's going to be Thursday um, evenings. Um, I believe it's at 630. And Celebrate Recovery is a 12-step program uh, that is similar to AA, but it's really... I should have Ernie talk about it. It's Christ-centered, and, and then there's a lot. It's for people who have codependency, um, all kinds of issues. I should go to that class. So um, I actually just read the book, Codependent No More, because my daughter's therapist told me I should. Anyway, so um, <laughs> moving along. Um, also coming up, we have uh, May 20th. We're going to have a tailgate sale. And Audra, Cindy, and Kitsy, if you guys want to wave, they're putting that together. That's a fundraiser, and it's also a way for you to get rid of your stuff. 
You got a lot of stuff. I know. We all do. We're Americans. We've got a lot of stuff. So if you have stuff you want to get rid of um, or if you want to come and just shop, um, there's going to be a bake sale and some other fun stuff. So they're going to be out in the foyer with more information. And then um, the last thing I want to talk about is I'm going to talk about giving. We are a nonprofit, so it's because of you and your generosity that we are our doors stay open and that we're able to bless our community and do the different things that we want to do, um, outreaches. And so we have this little card here, actually even a little code there. You can give digitally online or you can do it old school and turn it in uh, in person. We have little giving boxes throughout uh, the facility. So um, our kids ministry, I mentioned last week that we um, were in need of, our, we're growing, we're getting more families and so we're in need of more help in our children's ministry. And three women signed up, and I don't know if they're in here or if they're still already helping. Gina Fritzke, Jillian Fritzke, and Phoebe Lee Sanders. And so I just want to say thank you for hearing the, the desire for um, that desire. We, um, we want to create a safe place for our children and have a lots of fun activities. And so, so the way our children's ministry works is we have a nursery, zero to four, and that starts right when church starts at 10. But then we dismiss the kids, which I'm going to do in just a second, right after worship so they can join families and sing with us. And that's kindergarten through fifth grade or 12 years old. So um, right now, you can be dismissed. We just need parents to sign your kids in. And then you can take a break, meet somebody new, get some more coffee, say hi. Then I'm going to actually ring a bell, like old school house bell. I'm going to ring a bell in a few minutes for you to come back in here. So yeah, you can go meet somebody, say hi, get some coffee, and we'll see you back here in a few minutes.
All right, if you want to find a seat, we'll uh, move forward this morning. I hate to break up the great conversation, but uh, we got things to do and places to go here, so. <laughs> uh, we uh, had uh, somebody new to our church a while back, and she, she's like, she goes, I, I called my family. I said, that church has intermission. <laughs> I've never seen that. You know, like when you go to a play, you know, and there's two, they have intermission, yeah. Oh, that was good. That was good. Well, great to have you this morning. I also want to point something out in our weekly, and that's here, and that here at the gathering, we do ministry from the bottom up, not just the top down. So that means that if you feel God has something, put something on your heart, has a call to, to uh, benefit the community, to start a ministry, uh, we feel like the church should rally around each other and help each other in what God has called you to. So I just want to kind of communicate that, and let you know that we, you know, we mean that with sincerity. Um, we don't have a lot of money, but we had a lot of love. So you know, we figure that. Uh, <laughs> um, I want to know that's something we uh, we do. And we don't. We intentionally don't do a lot of plate spinning and programming because we want to keep space open for, for you. Oh, let me put that. I'm just going to shake this thing. I'm just going to knock them down all, all morning. All right, well, we are in part two of our series called Eating and Drinking with Jesus. Eating and Drinking with Jesus. And before I jump into it, I want to go over kind of uh, at the gathering, we use the term apprenticeship to Jesus. And if you grew up in church, you heard the term disciple. And so basically interchangeable. But as an apprentice, it means that, that we try to model our life around three things. And that's to be with Jesus, to spend time with him. And we have practices around that that we encourage all followers of Jesus to do. Practices of listening prayer, silence and solitude, Sabbath, um, obviously, uh, uh, anything that will uh, kind of quiet the busy busyness and the din of your life and get in the presence of Jesus. And so that is being with Jesus. The second thing is then is we, that we like to study Jesus, and that means to read the Gospels, read his, his teachings, and also discern his life and the way he did things. And then lastly, to, to do what Jesus did. Or a better way to say it, what would Jesus do if he were me? If he had my life, you know, my bank account, you know, my family, my house, my car, you know, my time, my 24 hours, what would he do if he were me? And these things at the gathering, we like to organize our lives around, encourage all followers of Jesus to organize their lives around these three areas, hence becoming his apprentice. And at the gathering, we think that modeling the way Jesus lived is as important, if not more important, than obeying his moral teachings. His moral teachings, in fact, we believe they really only make sense when we actually step into a life with Jesus, beginning to look at the life of Jesus and then apply his actions to ours in the best of our ability. So in this series, we're going to look at the practice of Jesus of eating and drinking. This sounds like a pretty fun practice, right? Would you go get me some water? Oh, look at that. Tell you what, what a good wife. Huh? I do like it about 140, though. It's a little cold. If you can be warmer next time. <laughs> when you've been married as long as we have, you know, you can... You, long, yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Any good marriage counselors out there? If you, um so yeah, so we're going to look at the practice of eating and drinking. Now, if you missed last week, I encourage you to go back. You can find it on Facebook or at, at TG Shasta or at our fa um, YouTube channel. 
Um, cause I, but I'll try to do a little recap because these two really connect together. So I'll do my best. <clears throat> so last week we looked at two accounts in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, one with Zacchaeus, a, a despised tax collector that Jesus invited himself to his home for a meal. And the other one we looked at was where Jesus was invited to the home of a religious leader or a Pharisee is what they were called in those days. Probably the best translation for a Pharisee today would be pastor. But I don't like to use that term because Jesus was always blasting them. He was always getting after them. Um, so we, we pastors don't use that, but that would probably be the best uh, uh, equal term. So we looked at those two accounts, and we looked there in Luke 7 where Jesus was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of sinners. And you think that. I don't think that was true. I, I'm, I'm, I'm positive it wasn't true, but that was the reputation the religious people he got by the religious people, and they accused him of being that. Accused him of being that. In Luke and Matthew alone, there are almost 150 references to Jesus and food. To almost 150 references to Jesus and food. Um, scholar Robert Karras, a Catholic scholar, got a great little book called Eating Your Way Through Luke. He said that in... In, in, the, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. So it's just packed with these images and these, these stories of Jesus eating and drinking. It was a major practice for him. In Luke alone, it starts off in Luke 2, where Jesus is born in a manger. You know what, that, that's a feeding trough signifying that he is going coming to be food for the world. He eats at the home of Levi, another despised tax collector, who also his other name is Matthew, wrote the gospel, he was a despised tax collector. Jesus eats with a bunch of his friends. He eats at the home of Mary and Martha, who was Lazarus' brother who died and Jesus rose from the dead, if you're familiar with that. He was anointed at Simon the Pharisee's house. That was a story we looked at last week. Anointed by an immoral woman. But then the, Jesus flips the tables and shows her to be the righteous host and this religious leader, this pastor, to be the ungrateful outcast outsider. So he flips the story in this dramatic, ironic scene. Uh, and another, another uh, meal later on in Luke, Jesus just unloads, blasts the Pharisees for, for their hypocrisy. Um, there's a story of the prodigal son, which is quite famous. In fact, this painting uh, by Rembrandt is based on Luke 15 and the story of the lost son. And this shows the, you know, the son running back to the father in rags. And in that, scene, that story, Jesus finishes it with a feast. The father is so grateful his lost son has returned, he kills the fatted calf and puts on a party. And this younger son, the prodigal, the, the son that wasted all the father's inheritance, is in the feast, and the older, righteous brother who never left the father's side refuses to go in. Now, the, the, the imagery, Jewish imagery for heaven was a party. And so if you think of the implications of the story, Jesus says that this, 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 this sinner who you think is this wayward, wasteful person is at the feast with the Father, but you, you religious person aren't there. So it was a scathing indictment, again, to the religious leader of the day. And I think for all of us who would consider ourselves righteous or religious, uh, something to stop and take note of. Uh, Luke 19, also a story we looked at last week, Jesus invites himself to Zacchaeus' house, where, where it says the crowd grumbles and complains because he's going to the home of a notorious sinner, and why you shouldn't do that. In the first century, table fit fellowship, which is really this, this formal term, um, theological term, is, was very structured. You did not eat with people that were sinners, which really didn't, didn't mean what it means to us today, but it meant not, not Torah observant. In other words, people that did not follow the laws of Israel. 
uh, and follow the, you know, the, the guidance of the Pharisees. So, so Jesus found, was constantly eating with people that he shouldn't have been. <clears throat> In fact, one scholar says that, might have been Robert Karras, I forget what I read, but my, uh, one scholar said that, that who Jesus ate with is what got him killed. Because he ate just constantly ate with all the wrong people. <clears throat> constantly ate with all the wrong people. <clears throat> uh, Tim Chester, who's got a great little book on um, uh, eating a meal with Jesus. Is that the name of it, Mike? Yeah. Mike and I are tag teaming on it because we're using it for our sermons. Um, <clears throat> And he said in the the term in those two passages I looked at last week, Jesus uses the term the Son of Man, and that referring to himself. And he says that that it's used twice in Luke, and he uh, he surmises that it's used once about his mission, and then a second time about his method. And so here we see in Luke 19.10, and I have those for you to kind of see on the overhead. Um, Got those, Declan? Luke 19.10 and... Are they, is it in there? Oh, maybe that one's not. By, by the way, Declan, that, let's give Declan a hand, right? This is, <clears throat> I didn't go over my notes with him before I, uh, so yeah, so this, this, he surmises that from Luke's gospel, Jesus' mission is the son, this is what he said of himself, the son of man ke- came to seek and save the lost. His method, the son of man came eating and drinking. <laughs> so if Jesus were to have a method, as best this scholar can tell, his method of evangelism, if you like, I don't really care for that term, it's not found in the Bible, so I can dislike it, um, but uh, it, it actually gives me some trauma from the 80s when, you know, in, in youth group, and you were, pre, you know, it was like you felt like it was your job to go get your entire school to come to youth group. Um, and uh, my youth group was a little weird, so nobody stuck uh, but me. Um, <laughs> but, but anyway, but as best you can, he can tell, this, this, is, this is Jesus. He says this of himself. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. How? The Son of Man came eating and drinking. So the question is, how were people transformed by Jesus? And as near as I can tell, Jesus had kind of two tactics if he was around the in crowd, kind of the, you know, the, might we say in today's world, if he was around the Bible-believing Christians, he would gather them together and preach and, you know, and correct where they lost the plot line and, you know, and expound them for not loving the outside. You know, he would preach at them and he would correct them. But if he was with somebody who was on the margins somebody who had been hurt by the church, somebody that wanted nothing to do with organized religion, he had a better option. And I submit to you today, he has a better option for us as well. And the option is this, open your home to them. Share a meal out with them. If you don't have a home, take the uh, you know, advice of Jesus, invite yourself to their home. And just make them pay for the whole meal. That's what Jesus did, right? I mean, Jesus, you know, he invited himself to people's homes and ate all their food, you know, and he, he was homeless. So he, actually, all his hospitality was done somewhere else, in somebody else's home, at somebody else's expense. It's like, I like this Jesus. I think I, think I want to become like him and do what he did, right? This is phenomenal. But in all seriousness, and open your home to people. And stay a long time. Invite yourself to someone else's home if you don't have one. Open a bottle of wine if that's your thing. Have conversation. Get to know them. Have small talk. Small talk's an expression of love. Right? Be present to the people you're with. Listen to them. You know, talk about the meaning of life. Talk about faith. But do it as a conversation. 
This is what Jesus, you never find, and I'm, I'm sure you maybe did it, but when you never see Jesus in a setting of a meal, you never see him preaching at lost people. And if, you, if, you, if that term throws you off, we'll get to that in a minute. But you never see him preaching to the down and out, the outsider, the disadvantaged. You just see him loving and serving. The only people you see him going after are, are my type, okay? The, See, when we, when we love people with our life, when we use our life as, as, a, as, a, as a way of inviting people into a life with Jesus, and we can show them his grace, and show them his love. Now, this, this term, as Jesus used, eating and drinking with the lost, and as I said, we'll come back to the, in that in a second, this idea of lo- what lost means, but it is what the New Testament writers call hospitality. And again, we touched on this last week. Hospitality in Greek is, I, I, wrote, I looked it up and wrote it down this week if you were here last week. Um, it's philozenia. Philozenia. It's a compound word that means love of stranger or love of foreigner, outsider, immigrant. And this can be a hard sell for Bible-believing Christians. It was in Jesus' day. But this is what hospitality in the original language means. Love of other. Love of foreigner. Love of stranger. And hospitality is first and foremost a heart heart posture of showing love to all. And then it leaks out into your life. It leaks out of your budget, out of your time. And out of the things that you've been gifted with. And it works its way into tangible acts of food and fellowship and relationship. Uh, all over the, our New Testament, the followers of Jesus are directed to practice hospitality. Peter and Kristen alluded to it. Peter said in, in, uh, in the first uh, um, Letter by Peter in Peter 4, he said, above all, 4, 8, above all, love each other deeply. So just in case, you know, if you're new to this Jesus thing, you're like, okay, what, what, above all, what do I do? Peter's got a, above all. And what does all mean? Yeah, hey, we're good. <laughs> all means all. Above all, love each other deeply. Why? Because lover, love covers over a multitude of sin. Well, how does it do that? He goes on, offer hospitality for those of you, those of you that are introverts without grumbling, <laughs> right? <laughs> without grumbling. You know, humans were just the same 2,000 years ago as we are today, right? Nothing's changed. <laughs> And he goes on to say in 10, I didn't write that down, but he says, use the gifts and talents God's given you to keep it all to yourself and don't share. No, to serve one another. See, as a follower of Jesus, we're called to look at everything we have as a gift. Our very breath, all of our property and our finances, they're all a gift from God to be stewarded. If we see everything in our life as a gift, then you don't hold on so tightly. The writer of Hebrews says this, says, keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Ever wonder? Half a dozen people in the last year share stories, some, some recent, some from the past, where, you know, it's like, you go, I think that was an angel. Wow. You see, hospitality is so very ordinary, and that's its power. See, that's its power. With Aria Butterfield, she's an author, and she's a fascinating, this gal, I read her book of probably four years ago, and it's called The Gospel Comes with House Keys. And um, 
you'll enjoy it if, if you're not, okay, no, I won't, do, I won't say that. Um, it, but it's, her story is phenomenal. She, so this gal, Rosario, she was a, a leftist, feminist, lesbian professor at uh, Corn, Cornwall University somewhere in New York. And she was beginning, she'd wrote an article in the New Yorker about how, how Bible-believing Christians are, what's wrong with the country. And a, a Presbyterian minister from somewhere back there wrote in a, a letter of response. It was gracious and invited her to his home for dinner. So she thought to herself, she's like, well, I'm, you know, I've, I've, I've got to write a book, so I guess I should meet some of these, you know, enemies of the state, you know. Um, <laughs> So she actually goes to his home, and she, she really, she's very open. She's like, she goes, he sat in, the, in, her, in his driveway for quite some time. What, what am I doing here? This is the enemy. You know, anyway, she finally went in, and him and his wife were there, and they had dinner. And she came back. She came back, went to a Bible study, started going to church, and became a follower of Jesus. And she, they just loved her. That, and she, she just, they just loved her. And now, she's married, has like, I don't know, a, 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 runs a commune foster home food bank out of her house, and is like, I could, I mean, God help me, I could never do what she does. I mean, I don't even, but it's just incredible. And here's the, here's the scathing indictment. I was just reading this last night in her book. Here's, here's what she says. She says, during the AIDS epidemic, we knew that Christians would want nothing to do with us and keep as far away from us as they could, so we knew we had to take care of each other. And that the LGBT community does hospitality way better than Christians. This is her, not me, this is her indictment. You see, one of the problems is that we confuse hospitality with entertainment. And they're not the same. They're not anything... Well, they can be close, but they're not anything the same in their purpose. And I know right now, if you're thinking, if you're taking me serious, you have some excuses in your head. I don't know how to cook. I'm not a very good cook. I don't have very much money. You know, uh, you know, my house is a mess. I don't have a big house. Um, you know, whatever. I don't have any matching silverware. Uh, you know, my fine china is plastic. You know, whatever, you're thinking all of the things. And you're, what you're thinking about is entertainment, not hospitality. Not hospitality. They're not the same thing. And it's, it's really gotten even worse in our culture because, I mean, how many hundreds of cooking shows are there out there? Right? In all these fancy, you know, kitchens, you know, with the... The cool, like, you know, copper pots hanging over the giant island that's bigger than our first apartment, you know, and this, you know, this massive, you know, massive commercial freezer and refrigerator and, you know, everybody's slicing and dicing and you think, oh my goodness, I could never cook like that. So, you know, and everybody's Instagramming, you know, their, their gourmet meal every chance they get. I have a favorite old scholar, uh, he's an Anglican scholar, N.T. Wright. He, he was listening to a, he was on a podcast, and he's like, and uh, he doesn't, he's not on any social media, but the interviewer was asking him about what does he think of all this social media and stuff, and he's like, well, it's the strangest thing. I hear that people are putting pictures of their food up, and he's like, why on earth would you ever do that, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, yes, thank you, you know, but, you know. <laughs> And so it, it, there's this huge bar and hurdle in our brains. And what entertainment, so here's the difference. Entertainment is about exclusion, not inclusion. You know where you're at in the pecking order on whose party you get invited to. That was never more true in high school and college, right? What, you know, what party you got invited to. You were on the in crowd or not. Entertainment's about exclusion, and isolation, right? Hospitality is about inclusion, where all are welcome. And entertainment is where you show off your home, your cooking skills. Hospitality is about, not about host and guest, but it's where host and guest, the lines are blurred. 
The lines are blurred. Hospitality blur. I, I, I got to read this right because I got it on the overhead. Hospitality blurs the lines between host and guest. We had some friends over this week, and they came in, and you know, there's something to drink. Just you help yourself to the every, whatever's in the refrigerator is yours. Right? Help yourself. In fact, you can wash your own dish when you're done. You know, that's <laughs> it. It's, it's great. And it lowers the, you, you're not there to entertain them. You're there to get to know them, to do life with them. You're there to show them what life is like, what you've been experiencing once you've found the love of Jesus and the, what, how he's changed your life. You're not there to convince them of anything but to love them. If anything, don't make your house too clean. I have a story in a second about that. Um, <laughs> how, entertainment is about a trade-off. Hospitality is about generosity. You know, in entertainment, it's like, okay, uh, I'll get the check next time, but you get it, you know, you get it this time, I'll get it, you know. It's about this trade-off, you know, of like, oh, you know, and, and I, I used to think this way. It's like, okay, you know, the Smiths invited us to dinner, but she's, she's a gourmet cook. This is a, a real experience, and their names aren't the Smiths, and it's <laughs> not from this town. Um, but we got invited over the house, and they're like gourmet. I mean, she is a gourmet. She's a cook. She's an artist. And um, all right, uh, this is Jill Binger. She painted that painting, actually, back there. Um, wonderful friends of ours. But when we first got invited over the house, we're just like, I know Kristen especially, she's like, she made some scratch dessert that was like, <laughs> I could just like, <laughs> I'm like, you can't make anything as good as this. She's like, shut up. No, you know, but, uh, you know, and we're just like, and so we're like, oh, I could never invite those people over. Until we got to know them, and it's like, they, they, you know, they were hosting us, but it, but it, like, you can, you know, you can, you can get intimidated really easy. Jesus said in Luke 14, he said, then he turned to his host. When you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. I don't know about you, but I, just, I was like, what's the big deal, right? Now, of course, that's what, that's what you do, right? That's entertainment. No, instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Then, at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Oh, something else going on here. Hmm. In 300 years, the way of Jesus became the dominant faith, some scholars believe, toppling the Roman Empire. How? How did this happen? They had no political authority. Much of those 300 years, they were persecuted and killed and fed the lions and were fodder for gladiator games. And yet this, this no-name sect of a sliver of a sect from the backwater Palestine of, of the Roman Empire became the dominant faith. How did it happen? They had no buildings. They had no Bibles. It wasn't going to be a Bible for 350 years. How did this happen? One home at a time. One meal at a time. All over bread and wine. This is how it happened. You know, we're going to do communion at the end. And this used to be, a whole, for hundreds of years, this was a whole meal every week. You know, the old, you know, Baptist potluck, right? Every week, potluck. I love potlucks. Kristen hates potlucks. <laughs> there's, this, there's this little, like, orange, jello, cottage cheese thing that you only, like, only little old church ladies make or something, I think. But I mean, it's like, I think they lace crack in with it because I could just like, it's so good. It's so good. You see, Jesus aimed hospitality downward as a form of justice and service to those less fortunate. He aimed it downward. The practice of eating and drinking, you can probably understand where I'm getting at now. <laughs> the practice of eating and drinking is central to the way of Jesus. Sadly, however, it's something that we've lost in America. Due to individualism, over busy lives, and you'd, you'd, you'd be surprised as the amount of leisure time we have, have now compared to any other generation in human history. And we're the busiest we've ever been. 
We're working often fewer hours. And all of these time-saving devices. I mean, when I was growing up, my grandma still had like the, the ringer washer that, you know, I got my fingers stuck in once, you know, like ringed your clothes out. And I mean, it was just outside. How many time-saving devices we have. <clears throat> and I thought 12 years ago, we moved to Bernie from the Seattle area. If you don't know Bernie, it's an hour southeast of us here. <clears throat> we moved to Bernie, and I thought it'd be different. I thought, wow, I thought, we're just going to have, because we gained, I figured this out, Chris and I gained 40 hours a week because of not commuting in the Seattle. We gained 40, and we didn't have long, we had short commutes compared to most city dwellers. But I figured we gained 40 hours a week. I'm like, there's going to be all this leisure time. We're going to, you know, we're just going to get the, and it was worse. Hospitality was almost worse. I was like, what, I, you know, what's, what's going on? It just, I bl blew my mind because I was just, you know, expecting it to be just the opposite. Now, no, don't get me wrong, right? People had us over and we had people over, but it's crazy how it was just not what I thought it would be. You know, a funny story, back to the don't make your home too perfect. <clears throat> um, the first year until we moved there, it was, it was at the bottom of the 06 housing crash. And a couple in our church had a rental that had been trashed and they couldn't, they, they wanted to get out of it. And they couldn't really sell it. So they fixed it up. They put like 10 grand in, new flooring. They just redid the walls, all the fixtures, outlet. It was like you walked into a brand new house. It was gorgeous. And they called us up and they said, we feel like the Lord, and we were living in a, a pretty small little house, nice little place, but small. This was big, two-car garage, had outbuildings, nice backyard. And I said, well, you know, we'll rent it to you guys for 800 bucks a month. And we're like, oh. So we moved into that. And so we had all this room to enter. We had a, it actually had a formal dining room, you know, with a dining table. Um, and so we're like, wow. So our daughter was dating a, a boy in high school. And so we invited his family over for dinner. We thought, well, we'll get to know these people. They've been dating a little while. So we invite them over for dinner. And I'll, I'll never forget what happened. When they walked in the door, the, the guy walked in the door. He stepped in. He was like, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, sh should I take my shoes off? You know, no, 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 that's fine, you know. And he was like, I've, I've never seen a floor so clean, you know. And I'm like, oh, well, I don't, you know. One, we don't have little kids, you know, shredding crackers all over the floor 24-7 like we did for 20 years, you know. Um, <laughs> why do kids have to gerbilize crackers? That is a mystery to me. It's like, just open your mouth, put the cracker in, close down. No, and then, you know. Anyway. So these people, like, and, and they were, you know, they were just like, you could tell all night. And I think we just bought, and we'd save money and bought a new dining room table, so it was new. But it was like, you could tell they were just, they were uncomfortable and couldn't wait to get out of there. And they left, and I was like, because they made a couple other comments about how clean the house was, you know. And I was, I tried to explain, well, it just got remodeled, you know. We just, we just moved in, and we don't have little kids, you know. We're, you know except for Rachel, we only have one girl at home, and she's, you know, she's pretty tidy. And, uh, you know, and, but I could, I, when they left, I said, they will never invite us to their house for dinner because it intimidated them, intimidated them. So the moral of that is, you know, throw a little dirt on your floor <laughs> and then invite people over, <laughs> right? We now live, and I think I shared a little bit of that last week, we live in a little triplex, a little 800 square foot triplex. We have, no, we have no dining table. But we got a card table. Move one of the footstools out, set the card table up in the middle of the living room, and it works. Chairs aren't that comfortable, but it works, you know. All right, now I want to take a little closer look and finish up with Jesus' language of the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Now, depending on where you're at on your faith journey, Jesus' use of this word might seem offensive. But in reality, Jesus assumes the best about people, about lost people. It's much different than, think of the, hear, think of the language you hear uh, that people use to, in today, and really for always, uh, about people that are different from them, or think different, or vote different. You hear things like stupid, right, evil, ignorant, um, you know, you hear disparaging language. I was telling Kristen, I think of, I, I didn't grow up in the church, but I started going when I was like 11 or 12, and this would have been 1980, so you had a, a, still a, a proliferation of, of the little old church ladies, 
Um, some of them were as sweet as, in fact, most of them, most of them were as sweet as you ever want to be, but there was that one <laughs> that just felt like they were, ah, oh, she was just always looking down their nose at you, you know. And church ladies can come as males too, there's, there's a cry, <laughs> um, but just that, you know, disparaging, you know, just ever critical, judgmental, gossipy, you know, just nothing nice to say about, you know, that you're that girl, you know, it was like my sister got pregnant when she was 16, you know, and this is in the 70s, you know, she, was, she felt shamed, you know. So Jesus doesn't use any of that language. He doesn't say any of that. He doesn't say they're immoral, bad, stupid. Everybody gets lost, right? Who's, who's been following their GPS and gotten lost? Who got, who's, who's had your GPS get you lost, Right? It was right, yeah. Was Give me right. No, exactly. We all get lost, right? Ladies share on Spiritful Friday. A lady said, she goes, and she, I'm a little lost right now. Yeah, we all get lost. You know, Jesus is, is not, it's not a disparaging term. Most people don't, who are lost don't want to be lost, right? <laughs> you know, if you like, classic old school hippies, you know, that are like, just, you know, I'm just getting lost, man, you know, and they're good with that. But for the most part, most people don't want, lost people don't want to be lost. They're looking for the right path to the right destination. They, they, they can't even, often it's not their fault, right? The GPS got me lost. The GPS got me lost. Jesus himself said that he came to seek and save the lost. He invited all into God's family to eat and drink around the Father's table. And if they wanted to be adopted into his family, to become brothers and sisters. And he did that one meal at a time. It's the best way to spread the love and welcome of God. There is, a, a, there is a, a, a humble pill to swallow and that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He, 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 he makes a hard declaration that we, we have to humble ourselves and say, okay, I'm going to say, I'm going to admit my lostness and surrender my life to you. So it does, it takes humbling ourselves, but he never once thinks of anything but love for us, whether we choose to do that or not, or to believe it or not. And see, to do this, to practice this eating and drinking like Jesus did, you don't have to add anything to your over-busy schedule. You're already eating 21 times a week. Just repurpose what you're already doing. Invite somebody out for coffee before work or a quick breakfast. You know, if you have a lunch break, get together with a coworker at lunch or a neighbor. You don't have to add anything to your already busy schedule. And this is something that all of us can do. And I encourage you to do in hospitality, you be yourself. You don't be anybody else. You're not there to, you know, bait and switch. You know, you're not there to try to sell them something, right? This is you know, not like, you know, multi-level marketing, but no offense if you are in it. But, you know, there's not, a, there's not a sales pitch. There's not a close. There's not anything. It's just, it's right. It's a meal to build relationship. To be yourself, to be present to the person in front of you and the God inside of you. And to love. And when we do this, I got to thinking, if even 30% of us started taking this serious... I think that alone, that, this practice alone, I think has more power to change the atmosphere of our community than anything else we could do. I think it's indeed why Jesus is what Jesus is primarily did. He ate with everybody from the, 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 you know, the highest religious, self-righteous person to the lowest you know, person on the rung of the ladder that no self-respecting person would ever go near. He did not discriminate who he invited into a life with him and into God's kingdom. 
And here's the thing, people are hungry for relationship. And they're hungry for a relationship with God. And if God is in you, who better than to offer that person relationship? Tim Chester in his book on a meal with Jesus, referring to Jesus as what he came to do, that what he came to do was brand new, that it wasn't Judaism 2.0, it wasn't, if you heard the series from January, you've, you've heard that, it wasn't the old temple model religion, it was something brand new that Jesus came to do. And he says this, compare the old way with the new way, the way of Jesus. The new way is gracious rather than religious, inclusive rather than exclusive, welcoming rather than unwelcoming. It is characterized by feasting rather than fasting, rejoicing rather than grumbling. It recognizes its need and finds hope in the Savior rather than feeling self-righteous and therefore rejecting the Savior. Worship team, would you guys come? You do not want to miss next week, part three. I guarantee you don't want to miss it. Mike's preaching. He's got something amazing to say. Well, we're going to finish up here with a couple of songs and two other things. We're going to do communion, and then our prayer team will be up here uh, right before communion wraps up. Prayer team, you guys come up so we can have more time. There's been more people coming for prayer. So, um, so as you take communion and you'd like prayer, they'll be up here to pray with you. And we'll sing a couple songs and pray together, and then we'll move on our day. So for here, for us, if you're new, communion, we practice open communion, meaning that no matter where you're at on your faith journey, if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, communion is open to you. For us, communion is a celebration. It's a celebration of the sacrificial love of Jesus, that he died on the cross, shed his blood, his body was broken for our healing, for our salvation, for our forgiveness of sin. And so the juice represents his blood that was shed. The cracker represents his body that was broken for our healing. And so when you take communion, take it rejoicing in the hospitality of God that he invited him. He came to our earth, right? He invited himself into our house, into our world, and came and became food for the world. And this is what communion symbolizes for us. So please feel free to take communion at any time. There's nothing worth more
There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You are our living hope. Your presence, Lord. And I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and
song we want to send you out with. And so I want to encourage you in this journey just to ask the Lord, kind of what, what would he have you do? Because it can, I mean, you know, I, can, I know it can feel overwhelming, and that's not the goal, right? The goal is not to overwhelm any of us. But to open, ask ourselves the question, if, you know, in light of the fact that I don't commute two hours, maybe you do, you know, if we don't live in the city like we did, you know, commute for hours, you know, I've got a, I've got a dishwasher now, you know, and it's not my son, right? It's a <laughs> actual commercial, you know, all these time-saving devices, and yet we host less than any, any gener- you know, generation humans in history. Can we, can we just even ask ourselves the question, where am I filling all this time? Of course, we know most of it's, you know, what, four and a half hours of it's Netflix, you know, but, uh, but to ask, the, not, not a guilt thing, but it's asking, Lord, how can this enrich all of our lives and change the atmosphere of our community? I think it's that powerful, that powerful. All right, well, we got one more song we'll head Amen. out with. All right. Amen. I'm going to send you out with a song, Fill My Cup, and, and that's what I pray that this hospitality season will be, that we're not taking from what we have to give, but that God would fill our cup and from the overflow, we will share with one another. Amen.
right, you guys, have a great Sunday. We'll continue prayer up here with Spotify if you guys want prayer. Otherwise, enjoy each other's company, and don't be shocked when I knock on someone's door <laughs> for lunch. Have it ready.